free to have a seat. Please. 
Thank you for the cross that you have carried. Thank you for your blood that was shed. You took the weight of sin upon your shoulders and sacrificed your life so I could live. that you have cared thank you for your blood that was shed you took the weight of sin upon your shoulders and sacrificed your life so I could live now nothing is holding
Thank you that we're living in your kingdom. Jesus, you're the king upon the throne. Thank you for the way you've always loved. Now I get to love you in return. Now I get to love you in return. I was looking for my microphone. I couldn't find it. It's on me. So I said, what happened to my microphone? Uh, I don't know. But anyway, uh, some people were saying that when I turned my head, they couldn't hear me. Some of you were blessed by that. Others won't want to hear, the, hear all of it. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, to say, to, to deal with that. So this morning, we have a water baptism today. And it's not an option. The Lord says, repent and be baptized. Baptism in water is a symbol of dying out to the old life, the old world, going down under the water and coming alive out of the water, testifying to the transformation of grace and salvation through Jesus Christ that you have in your life. We're having a picnic this afternoon, and uh, we hope that you can, can join us, uh, and, and we're just... Uh, looking forward to it, and I just encourage all of you to join us in the uh, baptism today. It's uh, at a park that's very near here, and so uh, I just want to encourage you to be there. Uh, there's a picnic, and I'm looking through my announcements here. I know it's here somewhere, but I don't, I don't see the announcement, but I'm yeah, sure. But, oh, no, that's, that's my song list. So anyway, I'm going to find it here, running a smooth operation here. And um, so, anyway, uh, it's not here. So what time is the baptism? So here, here we go. Here we go. Man alive, I've got so much stuff here today. So anyway, we're having the baptism at uh, 5.30 this afternoon picnic. And we hope that you can come and join us. And we're looking forward to it and encouraging every one of you to come. Uh, we have several things that are going on. Women's Bible study starts on Saturday, September 21st, 9.30 to 11 on Saturday mornings. It'll be a great time to meet together. Men's fellowships begin meeting September 19th at 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall. And the study women are studying walking with our servant Savior studies in the Gospel of Mark. And the junior high and high school are going roller skating and are having a party uh, at the rink on the, on September, Sunday, September 8th from 1 to 3 o'clock. And we're just excited about what God is doing, and we encourage you to keep that in mind. Uh, in October is coming up here. It's not too far off, and I, I, we'll keep talking about these things. Uh, October 14th uh, through 16th here at the church, Northern California, Nevada, uh, Calvary Chapels will be meeting here. Uh, the pastors and leaders, all of them will be here, and so we're just thank you for that. And then there is a national back to church drive that is going on Sunday, September 15th. There will be a lot of national advertisement and so forth around that, and we encourage you to do that. And so uh, that is the announcements, and we're just so thankful for all that God's doing here in our midst. And we're looking forward to having you, uh, having you with us. And there's a flyer and information about the baptism you can pick up on your way out this morning. And I really pray that you will be able to go. My goodness, I just found my announcements. So maybe we should do them over again. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, t uh, too many papers here. So, uh, it, uh, yeah, they're, they're all here. So we're looking forward to that. Let's stand together, worship the Lord in the ministry of giving. It's been miraculous how God keeps supplying the needs of his church and gives us this wonderful place to worship in, and God is blessing you. And if you're a visitor here today, we don't come around personally and ask you for money. We don't tell you how to dress. Uh, well, we encourage you to dress, 
But uh, other than that, we're not, we're not into that. We're into Jesus and having his life and his fellowship with us. And when you give, don't ever, don't ever feel that you're pressured here because that's not what God wants. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver whose heart is in their giving, who love the Lord, who believe that making God a part of your finances will not only be beneficial and eternal reward, but God will bless you and open doors of opportunity according to the scripture and keep the devourer away from our doors. Father, you are so wonderful and gracious, and I love you and thank you and praise you for this wonderful day to worship and glorify and magnify the name of Jesus. Bless this part of our worship, Lord, for we do worship you in the ministry of giving. Be glorified, and may this be a blessed day in baptism, and may each person experience a consciousness of how deeply and completely they are loved by Jesus Christ, our Savior, by our Lord. We ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. I've been held by the Savior I've felt fire from above And I've been down to the river And I ain't the same A prodigal return him down to his knees. Well, God, I've been broken more than a time or two. And then he picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. And that's why I sing, oh,
have a chair, please? I forgot to tell you to greet somebody. Just wait. Uh, we're so glad for every one of you are here. We had so many visitors the last three months. We have visitors again today. We want you to know you're just so welcome. And I'd like all of you to, you know, kind of hang around here on a regular basis to make sure that everybody you see, you say, Jesus loves you and shakes their hand on their way out. That's important. Just can, It's three words. Can you handle that? Jesus loves you. And then the rest of it is, this I know for the Bible tells me so, but you don't have to do that. Just say, Jesus loves you. Because he does. He loves us so much. Amen. When we look to the scripture and we begin reading the Old Testament, there's some people that say, how could God bring such devastating judgment on nations and people that reject him? He doesn't. Even in the Old Testament, he pled with people for long, many years, many decades. In the book of Genesis, Scripture tells us in the 15th chapter of Genesis in the 16th verse, he said, in thee you are, have been given this period of reconciliation with God. And when God spoke to Abraham about possessing the land that the children of Israel would ultimately go and take over, he said, you can't go into that land now when Moses read this. Because he said that the iniquity of the Ammonites is not yet complete. Now in the Bible, a generation is termed in three different ways. Generation could be 40 years. In the book of Daniel, it's 70 years. But in Genesis, with Abraham, he is timing the length of a generation from his birth to the birth of his son Isaac. And when Isaac was born, he was exactly 100 years old. So the scripture says that for four generations or 400 years, God pled with the people who were in the land that Israel was to take possession of for 400 years before judgment came. But God is righteous and God is holy. And if we don't repent, judgment will come upon nations and upon people. I have great fear and concern for our country. We were founded on the word of God. The, the Constitution of the United States is filled with scriptural principles. Many of the ones who wrote the Constitution were ordained ministers. All but a handful were powerful Christians, men and women of God, who founded this country and established it. And slowly but surely, we have turned as a nation away from God until we are willing to mock God in our universities, in, our, in the public square, trying to stamp out the very name and the consciousness of God and of Jesus. And so the scripture said that after 400 years, God is about to bring his judgment upon the nations in the land of Palestine that have rejected him and resisted him for 400 years. There's some people that say these people haven't heard what God, who God was and what God did, but that wasn't true. We're going to talk today about a harlot, a prostitute. There are some people that try to write and say that she was merely an innkeeper, but that's not true. She was a prostitute. What people don't understand, we should know about in our own culture, that people and just children and young people are captured and taken and imprisoned into the sex trades. Prostitutes normally were sold by their family or captured by someone to enter into prostitution. And they would have a house not only would it be a place of prostitution, but it would also be a place where strangers could come and sleep without entering into immorality. And so here this woman by the name of Rahab, we're talking about her today as we look in the book of Joshua chapter, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 today. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from, from Arcathian Grove to spy secretly Stay, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. 
So they went and, and came to the house of a, of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Didn't say she slept with her. They lodged there. And it was told for the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. There was a terror that came upon the people because of Israel. Because of the trade routes, and Jericho was on that main trade route from Tyre and Sidon and the Mediterranean, clear down to, to the, uh, across the country and, 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 and way down into the other parts of, of the inner t uh, parts of the, the land. And with them, they brought stories. And one of the main places of collecting information, they would slip in in the evening, not wanting to be seen, but they would take lodging and sometimes immorality in the houses of a prostitute. And Rahab had that kind of a house. And so they knew about what God had been doing. And the scripture teaches us that they wanted, they, they were, were fully aware of all of the miracles that God had performed and God had done through the ch children of Israel. They knew they were a tribe of slaves, two million people. Now, you recall from last Sunday, after only two years, they came right to the border of the Jordan River, ready to go into the land, and, and uh, Moses sent forth people into the land, 12 of them, to spy out the land and to say about going. And 10 of them came back and said, we're filled with fear, saying that we cannot go in because there are giants in the land. Giants. And so two years they could have gone into the land after they left Egypt. But because of unbelief, they had to wander another 38 years. And God said the generation that refused to go in would all die except for the two of the 12 spies that went in, and one of them was Joshua. And he went into the land, and he came back, and he said, it's a land of milk and honey flowing with milk. It's a rich land. It's a free land. Yes, there were giants in the land. But you know, Joshua had already conquered a giant. Scriptures tells us there were two giants that he conquered. One of them was Og, the other was Shio. And God and the children of Israel, they were on the other side, the opposite side of the Jordan River from the Promised Land. And Joshua sent and, and Moses sent word to them saying, If you let us pass through, we won't we won't hurt anybody. We won't leave the road. We'll if we get, get food, we'll buy it from you. We want to go and be peaceful as we march through your land of these two kings of the Amorites. And we're going to want to walk through that land. We're not going to do anything. But instead of accepting the provision of God, they rose up against Abraham. They rose up, they rose up against Moses. And they began to fight him. And God brought victory, and after 400 years of giving them the opportunity to come to the realization that the God of Israel was the one and only true God, they fought against him, and both of those kings were utterly destroyed, and one of them was a king by the name of Og, and the scripture said at that time there were giants in the land, and history tells us that Og had an iron bed that was 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. He must have been a big dude. Some say he was as much as nine or ten feet tall. And they were warriors. And yet they were utterly and completely destroyed. And so now the children of Israel not only had land in the promised land, but all of the land on the other side of the Jordan River, God now gave to them. And two and a half of the tribes who herded cattle and lived off of the produce of their cattle and of their animals, their livestock, they took over that land as God had promised them. So Rahab begins to speak, and, and so Scripture goes on and talks about what God was doing in, in her life. And so in the third verse it said, So the king of Jericho sent these words to them about the country, and then the woman took the two men, the two spies. This time Joshua wasn't taking any chances. He sent two men secretly into the country to spy it out to go across the Jordan River and sneak in there and look about what's going on. And so they're the ones that went in and they slipped into the city just, at the, as a, just before the gates were closed at night. 
And they went to this house of the prostitute, and there, there they were. And she said, yes, the king came to her and said, hey, wait a minute. Didn't one of a couple of men, spies from Israel that came into, your, into the city and came to your house? We, we had reports of that. They were watchful because they were so frightened. Now, you say, why is that? Well, for one thing, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God had a cloud over them in the day to protect them. And at night, there was a pillar of fire that was up there. So they were sitting there looking at that pillar of fire just the other side of the Jordan River. Jericho was very close to the river. And they knew that there were two million people over there. And they knew what God had done in their lives. And now there were fear. And so they came to him. And he said to her, they said, I, where are they? Where are those men that we sent over? And she said, the men that came, they, they came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, as is at night, when it was dark, that the men went out. And where they went, where the men went, I do not know, but pursue them quickly that you might overtake them. She used subterfuge. She said, would God use subterfuge? All through the Bible he did. Joshua laid an ambush that God told him to make. As this war was going on, this spiritual war, this, this physical war, and all through the Bible. But she had brought them up, and now she knew that she had to hide them. She was not only a prostitute, but she was also a woman that worked very hard. For her house was up on top of the wall, and the walls could be 30, uh, 10 to 30 feet tall, 6 to, to 10 or 15 feet wide. And the walls of the city encompassed an area of ground that was about the equivalent to uh, probably 7 or 8 acres. And they had all sorts of, of uh, weapons and, and protection for they were on the main, one of the main trade routes. It was one of the oldest cities in existence at that time. But they'd refused God. They'd refused his word. And they knew. You say, what did they know? Well, it talks about that a little bit later. And so she brought them up to the roof. And she took these uh, flax stalks and covered them up. Now, the reason she had flax stalks up there was they would take the flax stalks. They would boil them. They would treat them. And then they would put them in a dye with a big kettle of water and let it boil until it boiled away until they would have, have uh, the color of it, it and they would make clothing out of it. And so she had this big supply of flax and so she put these guys under this supply of flax. When they hid, well, the king searched everywhere. But to do that, she had to carry those up at least 30 to 60 feet to get to her roof. She had to have a pot and carry water up there and boil it. And then she had to work very hard to break down the flax and make material of it. And the color that they were well noted for was crimson. Crimson. It's amazing how God plans everything. But she had them up there, and as soon as those who pursued had gone away, he shut the gate. Then the Scripture tells us again, here in the second chapter, verses 8, now, before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Think about that. How did she know? She said, I know the Lord's given you the land, and I know that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all of the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea. And when he came out of Egypt, and what we did, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, and that, that's, that was Sihon and Og, the two kings that were destroyed. Og was the last one of all those people that was destroyed. He was the last one that was captive, and he was a, a monstrous man. And so she went on to say, that this, this challenge, I know what God was doing. You say, how could she? Because everybody knew about it. They had trade routes that went from the Mediterranean all to all of the cities and all the different countries at that time in, in, in the world. 
And they heard about what God had done through Israel and the fear of them. And then the scripture told the children of Israel, don't you be afraid because I will make them afraid. I will put fear in their heart. I will prepare them to be defeated for they refuse to receive the message of God. So in Joshua chapter 2 and 11, and as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any man more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven and on earth. That was her statement of faith. That was the time that she became a believer. He is the God of heaven and in earth. The scripture tells us that our only hope is to repent of our sins and accept the sacrifice, the crimson stream of the blood of Christ that flowed down from Calvary to cover our sins and forgive us and cleanse us of the past. Otherwise, we are still the children of the wrath of God. The only thing that withholds it is the presence of the Holy Spirit and God's continuing to work and the grace of God who comes through Jesus Christ. And so the scripture said, she said, look, I know that you're of God. I know that he is the God of heaven and earth. But now I have a family. And in the 12th verse, it says, Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a token, a true token, and spare my father, my mother, and my brothers, and my sisters, and all that have and dwell and deliver our lives from death. Deliver it. My brother's been ministry in the Middle East where it's very dangerous to be a Christian. There have been tens of thousands of martyrs in the last 20 or 30 years in the Islamic countries. There have been children that have been nailed to church doors and hung there to die. They're children that were forced to stand and watch the beheading of their parents. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But instead of the church dying, the church has grown remarkably in the Islamic countries. Thousands upon thousands of people have had dreams and visions and God has led them to Christians. And my brother and my nephew have been involved in ministering to the Islamic world. My brother for, for, for over 40 years, my nephew, uh, ever since he was a young, young man ministering to the Islamic world. They go into take uh, Arab-speaking pastors and go into the refugee camps in Europe and lead people to Christ. My brother just got back from Turkey where there are thousands upon thousands of Iranians who can go into Turkey without any kind of a visa. They can come and go as they please. And God is leading them to people who are coming to Christ and they are going back. And multitudes of them have gone back and brought the message of salvation to their families. And there is an underground revival. We can't talk about their names or the place here because they troll the Internet all the time and try to find people to persecute, to imprison, or to kill, to try to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they're turning to God by the thousands, as the Scripture said they would. Spare my father. Spare my mother. God, give us courage to keep talking to our families, to our relatives about Jesus. Even though it's a little uncomfortable. You might even be kicked out of Christmas. <laughs> Hope not. Because there's a death. The wages of sin, of separation from God, is death. And the judgment of God will ultimately come to every person. We're all going to be judged. If we're believers, we'll be judged at the great white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Where the works of our life will be examined, and the wood, hay, and the stubble, the Scripture said, will be burned up, the things that didn't count, the things that we did for pride or ambition or position. 
one of the things that is so desired in our culture now because of uh, just the nature of humanity and the power of social media is to have recognition, to have a title, to have an office. And there are many churches that know that. And as soon as somebody comes over there, they give them an office. They make up a title, and now they feel somehow fulfilled. But that's not what the Scripture is about. The following Jesus is about being a servant. Following Him. The scripture said, The least of you shall be greatest in the kingdom of God. God, give us the courage to talk to our friends, our brothers, our sisters, the people we come in contact because outside of Christ there is no hope. Or there's no other name given among men where we have any hope of salvation and eternal life. Other than that, we will have eternal separation, a place of sorrow and regret that will never end. So in the 14th verse, they said to him, they said to them, they said, so the men answered her, our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land, we will deal kindly and truly with you. We will stand up for you and your family. So he told them, he said, you've got to protect your family. And then she gave them some really good advice. She said, now that it's dark, now that, now that the men of the city and the soldiers and all of them have raced toward the Jordan River, you should get out and you should go up into the mountains, <laughs> the opposite direction. It was a mountain area that was filled with caves and hide out there until they give up and come back. And then you can slip back and cross the Jordan River and bring the news of what God is doing and so when they went across the river and they came to Joshua, they gave him a good report. They brought back fruit and milk and honey. And they said, God has given us the land. We'll go back there. See, it wasn't the tin. The tin kept them from going 38 years earlier until all of that generation, they died before they could go into the, into the, Holy, into, into the promised land. So these were the new people, the people of promise. And here they were standing there ready to march in, ready to go. And Joshua said, we're not going to go for three days. Why is that? Because he accepted the word of the two spies. And he said, we will give this woman Rahab. We're going to give her the opportunity to gather her family into her house that they will all be saved. God is so wonderful to us. When we come to Christ, old things have passed away. All things become new. We're a new creation in Christ. God didn't hide the fact that she was a prostitute. That was, that was in her past. She, she became a believer. She accepted the provision of God. She became a part of the tribe of Israel. And if you look at Matthew chapter 1, you'll find that her name is listed in the lineage of Christ. And she is a, goes back a few generations. And she's in David's, King David's lineage. She and her family came to faith. She went and got them. I don't know how she got them to believe her. Probably might have been that pillar of fire hanging out over there. And the fact that they had already destroyed these two, these two uh, Amorite kings and that God had worked miracles in their lives again and again and again. You see, militarily, they didn't have a chance to conquer these countries. But God put fear into their heart. God showed them that it wasn't them that was doing it, it was God's time for judgment upon them. But instead of repenting, they resisted and they turned away from what God was desiring to do in their lives. The scripture talks about these things. 
in Deuteronomy. The Bible says to judge from pottery and the various evidences of the ancient civilizations, everything the Bible said is true, including the destruction of Jericho. And we'll talk about it next week, but there was one section of the wall that was preserved more completely than ever, all of the other pieces that had fallen to ruins. She witnessed to her family. She challenged and, and reached out, and then she told these people, she said, look, I've done good to you. Do good for me. Not just me. I, I don't want to just have it be me, say, but my father and my brothers and my sisters and my friends and my acquaintances. And that's, that's one of the tragic things about Christianity today. We get so wrapped up in being blessed and lifted up and happy and everything in our own life. And there's nothing wrong with being blessed and happy. But when we forget our primary mission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that they would repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and spared from the wrath and the destruction of God that is coming upon the world. And finally, whether it comes in this generation on our own country or what, the moment we die, if we are not covered by the crimson stream of the blood of Christ, we, the scripture said it would be better had we never been born. The spies got out in an interesting way. She took both of that crimson cloth that she had pounded and beat the flax stalks and woven into beautiful clothing. And she had dyed them the crimson red until the plants and the substance and the minerals that they put into that dye, they would put the, put the cloth in there and they would slowly boil the water away until the dye became more and more intense, until the color of that crimson thing never would pass away. It would, it would retain that color for, for, for decades. And she took that crimson rope and led them to safety. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that cleanses us from all sins. It's his blood. It's his shed blood. It's what he's done for us. That's the only access we have into the, into the kingdom of God. And our privilege is to represent and tell people that God is not willing that any should die, but that all should come to repentance. It is not the will of God. You say, does God send people to hell? No, we go in spite of God. The Amorites had 400 years to repent. And so did all the nations that Israel destroyed. 400 years. Think about our own country. How many years have we had as a nation to repent? But instead, the overwhelming majority have gone the other way. Rahab. Isn't it interesting? We read about her in the scripture. She's mentioned three times in the New Testament. Scripture talks about her faith, of her courage, of what God has done through her. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, it said, By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. God doesn't hide what we are in the past. God's not ashamed of us. Jesus died for sinners. And I don't care what your particular sin or my particular sin is. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one of us can stand before a holy and a just and a righteous God without having the covering of the sacrifice, the crimson flow that came from Calvary, the covering, the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It cleanses us from all sin. In the book of James, chapter 2, verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the message 
and sent them out another way. James said, faith is how we come to God. But I'll show my faith by my works. Faith motivates. Faith moves us. That's why I was been so tremendously burdened. And at the first of the summer, God spoke to my heart and said, put the emphasis upon reaching out and bringing the good news of Christ to people outside the doors of the church. Do everything possible that we can do. And so God opened doors and God spoke to a woman and she sent the money. It was several thousand dollars to put 8,000 invitation cards into homes all over this area. We're praying over the fact that we're beyond this services on Roco TV. We don't have a huge audience. We have between five and 7,000 people watching us this morning. We don't have very few on Apple TV, but we're on there if somebody wants to turn it on. God has, God has a purpose. God has a plan. That's why we've had activities for the young people. That's why we've had picnics to bring in visitors, to let them know we care about them, we love them. And one of the things that God has for Christians to do is to share food together. To have the fellowship. And that's been the burden and the emphasis. Not everybody agrees with that. But that's what God laid on my heart. That's what God burned into my soul, is to reach out and to bring the message of Christ to as many people as possible, as long as possible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, For we are to God a fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the ones who are the aroma of those who, who have rejected Christ, it's not the aroma of grace, it is the aroma of death. For we are not as many peddling the word of God, as many are peddling the word of God, but of sincere, ser, sincerity, but as from God who speaks the sight of God in Christ. We're not trying to just teach the pleasant, acceptable areas of teaching and preaching. We're teaching the full counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. We're teaching the whole story of God. Why? Because we are perishing. We're perishing. Years ago, all of a sudden, I'd had so much energy. I seldom slept more than four or five hours a night for years and years and years. And all of a sudden, I was so tired. I was sleeping six, sometimes seven hours a night. And I wondered, what's wrong? Am I get, getting old? And that was, that was almost 14 years ago. I was just a kid then. A deceived kid, but I was a kid. What's going wrong with me? So finally... I went to the doctor and thought maybe I needed vitamins. He said, bring your wife in to your next appointment with you. Dr. Lashendani sat down with Mary and I, and he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but he said, you probably have no more than three or three and a half years to live, and the last year is going to be very painful. You have a very virile form of leukemia at that time. And we sat there, and we faced that reality. And it transformed and changed my life. God was gracious, and I was able to continue ministry through all of those years. And as I've shared many times, and I, and I don't know, you know, I don't know why God heals sometimes and, he, and physically, and sometimes he doesn't. I know we all have an appointment with death, and you don't die of good health. But the fact of the matter is, I don't know when my time is up. I don't know when yours is up. And if you know about mine, don't tell me. But I know for 12 years, I had that wooden pulpit up there. So I had, I could have enough strength to hang on when I lost my strength to finish the sermon. And God never failed me. But for 26 months, I have taken no chemo medication and there's zero 
cancer in my body at this time. That's, that's fine. Lord, why did you spare me? So I could bring this message of God's love and redemption and the horror and the tragedy of going into eternity without God. God, give us the courage of Rahab, who was willing to stand up to the king, who was willing to risk everything to hide the spies, and she would have been instantly murdered or killed or tortured. Covered them with the stalks of flax. Then, when the other armies and all of the searchers ran toward the Jordan River, she put that crimson cloth down, tied into a rope, and they crawled down that crimson cloth and went up into the hills, and then they went back, and we're going to hear the story next week of how God worked incredible miracles and did amazing things in bringing the city of Jericho into judgment. What is God's desire? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he loves us so much, he will not force himself upon us. We have to choose him. So many of the prophets cried out, Oh, why will you die? I close with the book of Hebrews chapter, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. The scripture said, if we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, what is the truth? Jesus said, I am the truth, the way and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What is he saying? If we reject Jesus, there is no other sacrifice for sin. No one else lived a sinless life. No one else was God who came and took upon himself a human body that he might experience all that we have and that he would live a perfect and a sinless life and yet in his perfect purity and innocence went to the cross and died for sin, not his sin, but our sins and the sins of the whole human race, past, present, and future, hung upon him and they poked it into his side and he cried out, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand it. I've not come to bring death. They're already in death. I've come to have life. And Jesus said, I don't want you just to have existence. He said, I want you to have life. I want you to have abundant life, a rich life, a full life, a joyous life, a powerful life, and a life that we know if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And I'm just praying and I thank God for all of you who share this vision, who share this burden. I'm not angry or bitter to those who don't share it. This is what God has called me to do and called us to do. And God is preparing the hearts of people by his spirit. And at the right time, at the right moment, when their heart is prepared, the Holy Spirit will breathe a little message into your heart. And they'll say, wait a minute, God will say, this is your opportunity to share the testimony of salvation. You say, what shall I share? Tell them about your encounter, your experience with Christ, because you are the world's leading expert on your testimony. And there's something about truth that people will believe it. So, he who rejected, he who rejected Moses' law died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? What is it saying? There's no other way to get to God but Jesus. No one else was perfect. No one died in perfect innocence but him. And no one rose from the dead and ascended into the presence of God 
For the scripture said he sits at the right hand of the Father, always making intercession and praying for us. God, give us courage. Give us the courage and faith of Rahab to share with our friends, with our family, any opportunity that you present, Lord, that we may bear fruit. And when we stand before you, we'll be able to lay fruit at your feet. For all of our works are going to be examined. And the scripture said they're going to be tried by fire. And we're going to find out whether they are wood, hail, and stubble, which will just be burned up till we have nothing but ashes. We won't lose our soul. But we won't have anything to lay at his feet. Or whether it'll be gold, silver, and precious stones. And gold, silver, and precious stones are not destroyed by the fire, but are refined by the fire and purified by the fire. You say, why do you want a crown? So when I stand before my Savior, that I will have received a reward that I'll have something to lay at his feet. I was invited to a minister's wife's birthday party on, on Thursday night. And she's served God faithfully and sacrificially for so many years. And I was going to see him, and I called him up, and I said, I'll be there. He said, did you know that this is my wife's birthday tonight, and we're so happy that you're here to come to the party? And I thought, man, I don't have any presents. So then I saw a Safeway. Flowers. Flowers. I didn't have a lot of cash with me, but I had a credit card. There was a long line there. So I said, how much are these roses? Oh, they're on sale. Seven ninety-five. dollars Sold! <laughs> and I brought them to the party. Ten red roses and two other unknown flowers <laughs> that were in the batch. And I was able to give them to her. And I wrote a little note. And I said, happy birthday to a great woman of God. She lit up, <laughs> took those roses. Then she found out I'd broken the stem on one of them. But anyway, we dealt with that. It was wonderful to have a little gift. Scripture said we need to lay sheaves at his feet, and that's talking about people. So God give us the power of the Holy Spirit and the vision of witnessing to share the good news of Christ. You say, well, people may be uncomfortable. They may not like me. It's all right. Scripture said you'll be hated of all nations and all people, you know, when you talk about Christ. It isn't, but don't take it personally. When people are angry about your witness and about your life, it's because they're in rebellion against God. And they're trying to find peace in all the wrong places. But the Scripture said that some might be saved. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. And thank you for smoothing the hard places in the road that leads to forgiveness and salvation. For you said in the word that if we would lay aside our pride and confess our sins, that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I'm not ashamed of you. I'm thankful for your grace and forgiveness. The great apostle said, I am not ashamed of the good news of Christ, for it is the message of salvation to those who believe. And I pray today that those who are struggling 
who have not fully committed their life to Jesus, that right now where they are, they'll receive you into their life and come out from under the judgment of sin that rests upon the whole world and be sheltered by the sacrifice of the blood of Christ. For the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses us from all sins. And you said, Lord, if we're not ashamed of you, if we'll confess you before men, you'll confess us before your Father in heaven. But if we deny you before men, you'll deny us before our Father in heaven. Speak to our hearts today, Lord. And I pray, Lord, in this atmosphere where there's such love and sympathy for every human being, that whoever is being led by the Spirit to come into the grace, Lord, we can't earn your salvation. You're not ashamed of us, but you look at us as what we are, captives and slaves to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. You set us free from that and bring us into peace and salvation. Give us the courage, Lord, to confess our desire in this moment to receive Jesus Christ into our lives. I'd like all of us together to make this, repeat this simple prayer with me because it applies to all of us. Lord, in Jesus' name, forgive me of my sins. I believe you are the risen Son of God. I know the emptiness in my life. And only you can fill it. So, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in the precious blood of Christ. For I now receive you by faith in the name of your Jesus, my Lord and Savior. By faith in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's one more step. You have become a part of the bride of Christ. So you have to share that with somebody. No secret weddings. If you're not ashamed of Christ and you've opened your heart to receive Christ, we'll have people here at the front. We'd be honored to pray with you, to welcome you into the family of God. Uh, we will rejoice with you. And we'll give you the Bible and some materials to strengthen you in your faith. And we're so glad that you came to hear the message of redemption and hear how patient and loving how God is not willing that any of us be lost.